I'm Shannon Flynn. The story is called Exile. My body remembers North Dakota. Wide, flat, golden green, grass, land into infinity. There was so much sky. Not little puzzle pieces between buildings, but enough to flatten you with awe. But exile was my parents' choice and their legacy. When I'm two years old, they move us from Grand Forks, North Dakota, to New York City and find an apartment in Brooklyn. On their modest social worker salaries, they can still afford $125 a month for a two-bedroom brownstone apartment in Park Slope. At night in Brooklyn, when my youngest sister is scared, I surround us with stuffed animals, small to large, and tell her teepee stories about how our great-great ancestors slept around the fire in and under thick buffalo robes, with the little people safe in the middle and warriors guarding the door. The dogs are protectors, too, bedded in dry grass under the teepee skirt. Where is our teepee, she wants to know. She's too young to understand a 19th century Canadian law that disenrolled Native women from their tribes if they married white men. The Indian Act would define who was a First Nations member until 1985. At age four, my sister wouldn't know the words forced assimilation and how they made our family too ashamed to be Native. I'm 11 years old when new landlords buy our Park Slope brownstone and decide they want to live in our apartment that our mother had beautified, stripping paint off the wooden shutters and moldings and restoring the stained glass, installing elaborate gardens on the back terrace where we played. A few years after we're evicted, my parents divorce each spinning into their unlived teenage fantasies of life in New York. My mother, a radical romantic, marries a WBAI radio DJ on a trust fund <laughs> and moves into his Chelsea loft filled with former Yippie stoners. My father, now out, fills his apartment with homeless boy hustlers and plays the savior, savior while soaking up favors. Neither scene is conducive to kids trying to do homework or wake up in time for school. By the worst of it, I'm in college living out of a backpack, hitchhiking to the city and back. I sleep with boyfriends or on friends' couches, and sometimes to escape the overcrowded party dorms, I hole up in a sleeping bag in the art department studio, hidden behind tall canvases until the custodian's mop wakes me up. In my 20s, I can still sleep on floors, share squats and subdivided bedrooms to pay the rent. I take over an illegal sublet in the West Village when I'm 30. The middle sister had lived there illegally too. And she shows me how she forged the tenant's signature on the money orders she mailed to the big real estate company on Fifth Avenue. Her handwriting is loopier than the tenant's, so I have to forge her forgery. <laughs> I use the light box at work. What do we know about the lawful tenant? His name? His age? His green card? He was Italian that he had two Akitas who dug deep trenches in the wooden floors and the door jam. We know him by his Tom of Finland catalogs that keep showing up in the mailbox. <laughs> and we hear the rumor that he had died in England while a kept boy was staying here. This was in the days when my sister's friends were call boys at the Headless Horseman and Julius at 53rd and 3rd. 
The apartment is haunted by ghosts who descend feet first from the bedroom ceiling. An old man and two pale girls with long fingernails. They are whiny ghosts, my sister says. Wimps, who she orders, go to your room. I am terrified of them, but it doesn't matter. The rent is 260 and it's 1991. Was my illegal sublet home? Maybe. I lived there for 20 years, filled with dread on every mail day. 20 years with that Acme safe dangling over my head, waiting for it to flatten me when the real estate players finally catch up with me. But I still think I was lucky to have had that apartment. How do you hug bricks goodbye? Once the apartment is empty, I spread my arms wide and press my body against the wall. Coolness kisses my cheek. Goodbye. Thank you. In November 2016, a dream of buffalo calls me to Standing Rock. I swirl into the shimmer of sky on snow and the herd's breath rises like clouds. Come home. My friend Tim and I drive west into scenes of cops firing water cannons at men, women, and children on a bridge in the 10 degree night just before Thanksgiving. There are bad head and eye injuries, a shredded arm, hypothermia, a heart attack. This is our last stand for clean water. And though the law jokes that they are clever to use water against us, no one has any fucks left to give for false authority, for, pe for fear, for pain. It is a good day to die, or at least to witness, hoping that nobody would. We stay in Michigan tent with Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi friends and their families. There's a school for the little kids and medical and mental health teepees. We hop in the kitchen tent, a massive operation preparing three meals a day for thousands from the seemingly endless flow of food donations. We sleep in long army tents heated by wood stoves. When the fire goes out, it is no joke. This kind of cold is an anvil blow to the head. Tim writes a song about wearing frozen shoes and an Odawa Iraq war veteran teaches me how to make fry bread. Every dawn sees the women shuffling through the snow together in our ribbon skirts to sing to the river. The surplus of camaraderie and meat means we can be generous and hospitable like our ancestors were. We can laugh around the fire and watch the children ride by bareback as if no time has passed. But no one can last on those plains in winter. This exposure drove our ancestors to winter camp in Minnesota, sheltered by valleys and trees. After the caravan of veterans arrive and Westmoreland Jr. apologizes to Crow Dog Jr. for depredations against the Lakota, then President Obama honors the Army Corps of Engineers' recommendations to shut down the Dakota Access Pipeline. The tribe asks the campers to go home before Cannonball River ice fills the valley. We feel we have won. Even though the next president reverses that decision and the pipeline goes through, and of course it leaks massively, I don't regret those walks over Badlands Bluffs, picking wild sage and hearing my grandfather's approving voice in the wind as buffalo pool and thunder in the valley below, unafraid of armed men. How would you feel if you were home? My friend Eliza asked me recently. I start to answer, but my husband comes in and right away his energy hooks into me. It's in his eyes, some need. 
At any moment, he'll start vacuuming around my feet. I can't talk now, I say to Liza, thinking for a moment. My old place on Hudson Street, maybe. Speaking these words, I realize that home would be a place where I can have solitude again. Writers are cranks. We're awful people. <laughs> really not fit to be around anymore. These days I spend hours scrolling through apartment and share listings on my phone. Nothing is affordable nor tenable. By now, everyone's seen the map of the US showing how there's nowhere in the country where average rent is affordable for people earning average wages. I've been looking for five years. I even moved out twice for six months each time. Both times, landlord drama pushed me out again. Ever since my husband and I ran out of things to talk about, he's become more of a roommate. There needs to be something more for us, or less. I look at the photos I've taken of Buffalo, staunchly rooted in a land of ochre and blue, but like the water that pretends to shimmer on Dakota highways, it's a mirage. There is no home in a state where my friends can't be served at Denny's, at best, or can be arrested or kidnapped, raped and killed for being brown-skinned. There is no justice for them. My Tewa friend, Beverly, whose adobe roots have spread into the desert floors for countless generations, she doesn't question where home is. She shakes her head and says she's sorry that I'm an exile. What does home mean to me? As a child, sheltered and snuggled by my fake fur animals, I dreamt hobo dreams, riding the rails with every train whistle. Home, as I imagined it, as a roadside camp, sleeping with a big dog at my back. Liza tells me that home exists inside each of us, like my heart that beats with Mother Earth. My home is anywhere where people gather to protect her. <laughs>